Hello, crafted entrepreneurs. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Trevor Mock. He is the co-founder and CEO of Carrot, a real estate marketing platform. Carrot provides tools and resources for real estate professionals, particularly those involved in real estate investing, to create effective websites and online marketing campaigns. And what's really cool is this is an eight-figure company. He's also exited several companies in his early entrepreneur days. And so he has a lot to say about all of that. This interview was so fun because we talk a lot about those beginning stages of entrepreneurship and really how tough it is when it comes to creating a mindset that serves you instead of sabotages you. So he's going to teach you exactly what he's done mindset wise to build an eight figure company. We talk about just the struggles and how to overcome it. And then we're also going to give you some really practical tips when it comes to online marketing and landing some deals for yourself. So I think you're really going to enjoy this interview. Stay tuned. All right, Crafted Entrepreneurs, I am so excited about today. I actually met uh, Trevor. Well, I didn't even get to meet you, Trevor, but I saw you on stage speaking at this mastermind that I'm in. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have to have him on the podcast because of your energy and just everything that you had to say about really living your life out loud and like also having like enjoying the journey along the way. I was like, more entrepreneurs need to hear this story that it's not all about making a ton of money. Mm. It's also about, you know, finding fulfillment in every area of your life. So I'm super excited to have you on. Can you tell us a little bit about how you became an entrepreneur? Kayla, yeah. F- first of all, thank you for the invite on here. It's it's something, like I said, before we, we hopped on, I never take it for granted. I absolutely love being able to share my bumps and bruises and wins over the years, and hopefully people can learn from it. So at, at a high level, I'll kind of start where we are, and then I'll go backwards. That, that way it gives people some context, and we can take it Perfect. wherever direction you want to go. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm Trevor Mock. I, I own and, and the CEO of a company called Carrot. That's a software company, Carrot.com. And we're a little over 50 employees, eight-figure year company. We're bootstrap, profitable, but it didn't start out that way. So if we like go way, way, way far back, I remember a time, Kayla, and it wasn't too far back, honestly, where I didn't want employees, right? I, I thought I had all these limiting beliefs in my mind around what entrepreneurship was or what would really unlock kind of for me that entrepreneurial dream. And it was it was honestly like the whole make money at home, internet millionaire, sit there on the, on the you know, the, the dining room table in your underwear kind of a the thing <laughs> that I was going after. And over the years, I, I got my first taste of, of entrepreneurship really way back when uh, in, in college. So my parents, they by necessity started companies, uh, cause my dad lost his job. This would have been the, the early nineties. And my mom said, well, shoot, I'm going to help out. And she was a stay at home mom at that time. She said, I'm gonna help out and I'm going to start a company. And so she started a company in our basement at home and she would have brides coming in and she'd help plan their weddings and downstairs in our basement. She went and bought some, uh, there was a store in town that went out of business. So she bought their display racks and she started putting a bunch of wedding things in there. And she had the, <laughs> this one row of, of uh, shelves and she had a desk. And then a couple of times a week, some brides would come in, they'd go downstairs, they'd lock the door for a couple hours and they'd come out. And that built into a business that now they do weddings, parties, events all over Southern Oregon, uh, multiple locations. And they've been in business for 30 something years, but it started by her just going, here's a need and I'm gonna go do everything I can to help supply for my, my family. So my dad started a company after that as well, around the same time, within a year or two. And th- this is this taught me a lot about entrepreneurship, Kayla, both good and bad. Okay, the good was, if there's a need, you can create your own job if you want to, right? You can go start something. You don't have to rely on someone else if you want to do that. And you have the grit to be able to stick through the, the challenges of a business. It also taught me what I did not want in business. Because I remember uh, Saturdays, Mondays, Fridays, whatever day it would be that our wedding setup and, and teardowns every summer and every spring, me and my two, two brothers, we'd be packing chairs, packing tables on Saturdays, Friday nights, tearing down on Sunday afternoons. 
And that was that where I'd be out there on summer in summers at my dad's business, washing equipment with the pressure washer with grease and oil going everywhere. And we literally lived above that business. So about five years later, we moved to a bigger space. The businesses grew and we literally lived above the business. Wow. And they would get the phone calls at 1130 at night and the big bell outside that rings for the whole grounds would be just ringing, ringing. My dad would answer at all hours of the night, every day, including holidays. And so I saw what it takes to build a business, but I saw, I also saw, I don't want these things. And so I, I think over the years, as I bought my first rental property, it was a fourplex when I was 21 years old in college, I literally Carlton sheets, infomercial, you can buy a property, no money down. And my dad saw that infomercial and he came to me and he said, Hey, I'll buy you this course, but here's the catch. You have to pay me the 500 bucks at the end of the end of the year. If you take this deal, you got to pay me $500 for that course. If you don't buy a property, if you do buy a property, oh, wow. you get the course for free. And I had to make a decision because I didn't have 500 bucks. So I'm like, okay, yes, I'm going to get it. And now I'm going to figure out how to buy a property. No money down with none of my dad's help by the end of the year. And I did, I picked up my first fourplex, no money down, still on that property today. Cash flows amazingly well. And that kind of started my entrepreneurial journey. What made him want to do that? Like he sees this infomercial and he's like, Trevor needs this. Like, yeah, it, it's a good question because I've got an older brother who's three years older and then a younger brother who's six years younger. And my older brother, he works for my dad, but he's not the entrepreneurial mindset. He liked to party in high school and college and do all those things. And I tended to be the more reserved or, or risk averse at that time. Now I'm the one who is more, uh, I will take the risks and my brother's more risk averse. But <clears throat> him and my dad and I would talk about all kinds of things around business. I remember really, really young, uh, he was telling me about, hey, did you know like you can buy a house in foreclosure for $600 or like it was <laughs> things that he was seeing on TV. And I kept telling my dad, I'm like, I've got $200 of birthday money. Like let's go in business together. We never did it in those early days, but I think he must've saw something in me that, that I wanted something different. And in, during that time, Kayla, in, in college, so for anyone who's kind of trying to figure out what do you want to do in business, right? There's probably a lot of people listening to this call that are saying, I don't even know what I want to do in business. Or maybe I started a company and I'm not even sure if it's the right one, right? The first thing I want to do is give you permission to try things. Like at the start, I always say sample. You need to sample so you know as much what you don't want to do as what you want to do. And before my dad gave me that, that uh, challenge, I was sampling. I started a little landscaping company. We did about five gigs and I would recruit my uh, baseball player buddies. And on weekends that we didn't have practice or games, we would jam for 12 hours a day to get a landscaping job done and we'd make some good money. After five, day, after five projects, I realized I didn't want to do that. I ruled that one out, sampled it and said, <laughs> nope, that's not it. That was quick. <laughs> exactly. And there was a couple other things I tried to start and pretty immediately just determined I didn't want to do that. And I think my dad said, hey, maybe, maybe this is it. Wow. So I love that advice. People sometimes need that permission slip. Like it's okay to not commit to something mm -hmm. and just try out some things. There's a lot of people listening in right now that, you know, they've, they've done what society has told them to do, which is, you know, go to school to get a good job and, you know, take the least amount of risk in life. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they found that the safe route for them is not fulfilling. So, yep. so you, you bought your first fourplex and tell us what happens next. Yeah. So got the first fourplex and, and I had a college professor named Ari DeGroote. He was like a really, really charismatic guy. He was the business law professor, which should have been like the most boring course at the college, but it was really fascinating because the way that he showed up to the course. Mm -hmm. And so Ari was a real estate investor himself. He bought properties and he was an attorney and he would kind of teach how he was doing uh, law. How, he would teach law through his real estate deals oftentimes. Oh. And I go, man, if this guy comes in here with this much passion and energy, like I just want to, I want to do what he's doing. And there's real estate and there's law. And I go, cool. I've already got one property. Let me see if I can't do this more. And now let me just get the law side of it down. Cause maybe that'll help me do real estate better if I, if I was a lawyer too. And so I studied pretty hard. I think that was like the first real thing in college that got me to buckle down on school. As I said, I want to get into law school and kind of follow this path that, that my professor had. And um, I, I got 50% of that right. I got the real estate part, bought some more properties, but I flunked the LSAT twice to get into law school. So oh, completely wow. bombed it. And those are some of those moments when 
I think in those moments we go, why, you know, why did this happen to me? Right. I had this path all, all lined out. I thought this is where I was going. And in hindsight, Kayla, that, that was like one of the best things that could have ever happened to me as far as a failure. That failure, uh, I, I truly thank God put that failure in my life to say, hey, you know, number one, you got to learn because you've had a lot of wins. I need to knock you down a peg or two. But also, this isn't your path. Your path is something different. And so after that, I moved to Portland with my um, then wife. We got married right after after uh, college. And um, I gave myself a year to figure it out. I, I just said, uh, I will probably give up on something if I don't have a real timeline to it. So I'm going to give myself a year, which is long enough to get something working, but not so long that I'm going to drive myself into the ground financially forever. And um, my wife was going to uh, get her master's degree. So she wasn't bringing in an income. She was you know, we had, we had loans to pay for her. And I said, I'm not going to get a job. I'm not going to get a job. We got it. We've got an apartment and I've got $2,000 in the bank now for my landscaping projects. And I'm going to figure this thing out. And, um, that set off the whole next year. That was probably next year and a half as an entrepreneur was one of the hardest times, but also looking back, I learned so much and I can give a couple mindset shifts that I gave that, or that, that I, that I had during that year and a half that really helped me to catapult from I had an idea and I had challenges and I couldn't figure it out to starting my first seven figure company after that. Wow. I'd love to hear what happened. Yeah. So that, that first year, and, and I'm, I'm going to try to relate this to as much as possible for anyone in any phase. So if you're, if you're yeah. listening to this and you're already a seven figure entrepreneur here in the, in the session, we'll maybe get to how, how to get to an eight figure entrepreneur. What are those mindset shifts you have to make? But if you're just getting started, or you're, you're making a couple of bucks, you want to make your first hundred thousand or you're making none. You want to make your first thousand. A couple of mindsets were key for me. So you talked about risk a little bit ago and you talked about that we may be risk averse. Um, I thought about that a lot at, at that time. And, and for me, what I now call flipping your risk profile, I thought it was more risky to not go try to start something. And so I was sitting there talking to my friends and my friends were getting great jobs out of, out of college, right? They were, they were graduating with these degrees like nuclear med tech and, and all these kinds of things making seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year. And it was really tempting to go down that path to go, that seems kind of guaranteed on the financial side, uh, guaranteed to a level, right? It's guaranteed to have an income like this. Now you have, you have a, a cap for sure. Uh, there's not a ton of optionality if you get that drilled down like you're an engineer or whatever it is. Not a lot, not a lot, a lot of optionality what I can do with it. But I said, the big risk that I actually think they're taking is I already see one of my buddies getting locked into things he doesn't like to do in that work. And that's going to be his career for the next 35 years, 40 years. That to me is a big risk that you're mm -hmm. 100% guaranteed to live this life that you may not actually enjoy because of that career path. And I said, well, What's a bigger risk if I flip that risk profile? Uh, risk number one is what if I take a chance to try to start this company? What's the worst that could happen? So I like wrote down all the things that are the worst that could happen, right? The worst that could happen if I, if I don't get a job and, and figure it out for a year. Well, I don't pay my rent and in Oregon, it's going to take a few months to kick me out of that apartment. And then, so that gives me 90 days. And then I would go move back in with my parents down in Klamath Falls, which like, wasn't the worst thing in the world because I lived with them just a handful of years before that, right? So I'm right. going, that's not terrible. I mean, it would suck, but it's not terrible. And I would have some debt and I go, well, I'm still young. I'd be able to figure that out. And I could still go get that job. I could still mm -hmm. go get the job at, at Nike or whatever. That was my backup plan to go to Nike up in Beaverton and get a job. The other option then is I go get that job now that feels like it's more guaranteed, that, that seems like that's what everyone's telling me I should do because I'm sitting here messing around six months in with no money in my bank account. And everyone's asking, what's your plan, Trevor? And there was this joke that kept happening, Kayla. And if anyone can relate to this, just feel confidence in yourself because my friends from college or my parents or my grandma or my older brother, not my younger brother, would, would come to me like, how you doing? I'm like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm working. I'm trying to figure it out. And they're like, what are you doing right now? Like, I don't even know what you're doing, Trevor. I go, you know what? I would try to explain to them, well, I'm doing this marketing thing. Or I'm trying to pick up another property or I'm doing whatever. And I just stopped trying to explain things to people. I said, mm -hmm. you know what? I've got a plan and I'll figure it out. Once I, once I figure it out, I'll let you guys know what I'm doing. And I just stopped doing, I just, I've got a plan. I'll figure it out. Once I figure it out, I'll let you know what I'm doing. And so I did. I just put my head down. I looked at that path that everyone else was taking. And I said, that to me is 100% guaranteed to take me where I don't want to go. 
Yeah. This path over here has a very low chance that I'm going to get evicted out of my apartment and go back and live with my parents. But even if I do, I'll go get a job. So the real risk is not taking the risk. And I think that's where people need to make that flip that risk profile. Absolutely. Okay. So you go in, I love that you're like, you know what, I'll talk to you in a, in a year or so when I have it figured out. And I think it takes like a, a bit of confidence, not a bit, it takes a lot of confidence in yourself to just be able to not have to justify what you're doing with your life to other people. And yeah. I love that you did that. And I honor you for doing that because it just gives everybody that's listening in right now, like, you know, if, if you're figuring it out as an entrepreneur right now, you don't have to tell the whole world how you're figuring it out, yep. you know, yep. <laughs> just keep going on your plan. Okay. So you're starting to get these properties. Like how do you end up with an eight figure company in carrot? Yeah. So it, it really happened. This is kind of a little bit what I talked about at uh, the family reunion event was at that time, I was just trying to make my first hundred thousand a year, right? I, I go my first real goal and I literally wrote it on my wall. And this is a little hokey, woo woo wee, whatever it is, session of this, of this call. But I don't care what people think. When you put down intentions on paper and you put it in, in an area that you look at all the time, it works. Uh, when you visualize, yeah. it works. So it was about eight months in probably that first year, Kayla, and it wasn't working. Okay. I'd, I'd put the goal, the original goal was 4,000 a month. Cause I'm like, if I get 4,000 a month, then I don't have to go get a job now. Right. And, and then after that, after I hit that, it became uh, 10,000 a month and then it grew from there. But I, I remember I put that piece of paper on the wall. I still have this piece of paper today back there. And, um, it was on the wall in our apartment building, uh, in our apartment. And anytime someone would walk in, it's in the living room. Like it wasn't the bedroom, it was in the living room. I'm like, <laughs> I want it to be so accountable, but it's right there. And I have to walk by every day when I go to my bedroom. And um, people would come in, they're like, oh, what are these goals? They kind of like make fun of them a little bit, you know? And I go, yeah, those are, I just want to make sure I see them every day. That's why, that's why they're there. About eight months in, I was nowhere near hitting those goals. So I took that piece of paper, I crumpled it up, I threw it in a drawer because those goals started to actually be demotivating for me. And I don't mm. know if anyone can relate to this, that you make a goal, you're all pumped about it at the start, but you've worked so hard to try to get the goal. You've tried six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 things, and you start to not believe it yourself. And every time you walk by it, it reminds you on how bad you're failing on that thing. And so I crumpled it, threw it in a, threw it in a drawer. And I remember about two years later, we had moved out of that apartment. We had unpacked things. I had grabbed, it was a year later, I had unpacked things. I'd open up that drawer, forgot about that piece of paper I crumpled up, looked at every one of the goals, I'd hit them all. I'd passed them all a year later. Like way wow, past Wow, that gives me all. chills. Wow. Way past them all. And I looked at, and that's why I kept that paper. I'm like, this is crazy. This can make a cool story someday. And what, and what I did to do that was the first thing I stopped thinking about me. I started thinking about how can I just add value to other people? That first, that first eight months, all I was doing, Kayla, was I need to get mine. I need to pay my bills. I want to get this thing started. I'm going to figure out what skill sets I've got. I've got some real estate. I determined for me that being an active investor isn't what I wanted. I tried it. I tried to do some wholesaling. And some other things. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to build an active business doing marketing. I love marketing. And I'm going to take my income and put it into real estate for the long term. That's my strategy. So I decided that about halfway through that year. And so then I go, okay, what am I going to do on marketing? And I started taking my skill set that I'd learned and grown and started studying everything I could on marketing. I go, if I can learn marketing and become a really good marketer, I can translate this to anything. That was kind of what mm -hmm. I felt was my, my ticket. Right. Mm -hmm. If I can master marketing, I don't care what the product is. I can just go anywhere with it. Yeah. And so I started learning everything from everybody. And I was going and pitching local businesses in Portland, Oregon, online marketing stuff, mainly SEO types of things, making your website convert better. Cause that's what I had started to do and started to make some money online doing. Was what what time frame was this? Like what year? This would have been 2007. Yeah, okay, so, 2007. so it's still new. Like the internet is still new at this stage, especially. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was in the way that I got latched onto the internet. So I, I was really pumped about marketing and, and to make, to pay any bills, I actually reached out to a, a, an uncle of mine who lived up there. He's a mortgage broker. I'm like, Hey, uncle Larry, do you have any kind of work I can do? And he goes, you know what? Two days a week, come into my office. I'll pay you this amount. It, it was under a thousand bucks a month for like a lot of work. It, it was making no money. And he's like, just cold call Craigslist people for me for mortgages. And then I was cold calling Craigslist people and I would get a commission if I landed one. I never did land one. But then he came to my desk one day 
and he, he says, Trevor, pull up the computer. And I do. And he said, Google search like mortgage brokers in, in Portland. I do. And he goes, he goes, how do I get right there to the top of that thing? Wow. Cause he's nowhere to be found. And he goes, can you help me get there? I go, I don't know. I've, I've launched a site or two, but yeah, yeah, I'll figure it out. And so I saw that as an opportunity. I go, I know some marketing things. I'd launched some websites for my real estate business. I had gotten some leads. Now let me just figure out the SEO thing. And so that's what spurred me on to the SEO things. I solved his problem and we got him ranked really good. I put everything I could that next year into learning SEO. And during that time is when I started to really start to pitch people consulting contracts and going back to that mindset of me trying to get mine versus helping people get theirs. I wasn't landing any consulting contracts. Uh, I was working for Larry for a thousand dollars a month and wasn't nearly paying my bills. And I was pitching people left and right and getting no, 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 no's, even though I had the skill set for SEO because I'd built it up. And so I just shifted it and said, you know what? What if I just stop trying to sell people things? What if I just go help them? And I switched it. Those people I would be reaching out to, I literally just shot them an email. And I don't remember what video thing I used at that time, or maybe it was a screenshots, but I did some sort of video or screenshots. And I said, here's the five things I would change in your site if I were you. They're costing you some rankings and conversions. You know, just have your web person go change these things. Hope you're doing amazing. Da, 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 da. That was it. And now let's move on to the next one. I do two or three a day. And what, what I found happened, Kayla, was most of the people had no web guy and they didn't know how to do the stuff. <laughs> and so they're yeah. like, well, this is awesome. You gave me all this advice. You're obviously not trying to sell me things. Could you just help me do this stuff? Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I could help you do this stuff. And so I just started Absolutely. figuring out a really low <laughs> price and I kept making my price go higher. So that, that was the first thing. It was a marketing consulting company. Well, I love that you were willing to, because sometimes people, I saw in a post uh, the other day in a Facebook group I'm in, this guy was like in total victim mindset. Yeah. He's like, you know, uh, I just need to get paid what I'm worth. And it's like, people don't know what you're worth paying until you give them a little like idea, yep. you know? And so you have to be willing to put in a little work at the forefront and yeah, you're mm -hmm. not going to land 100% of those people, but you've got to be willing to show that you care, you know? So I love that you did that. 100% show, show that you care. And, and also the, the thing I was making a massive mistake on, I've done the same thing in other businesses. Every time I'm doing really well with marketing, it's when I make great stuff and I give it away, right? Make great mm -hmm. stuff, give it away, make great stuff, give it away. And, and oftentimes we try to hold back our best stuff in our marketing because we go, oh man, you know, let's say, uh, so the second business I started was an online publishing company, right? And at, at the start, we're going, we're going to take these little nuggets and give them away in these free things and keep our best stuff over here. And it wasn't working. And then my, my business partner, Patrick Riddle, who's in Family Reunion, they now have a $25 million a year company. At that time, we're like, how do we grow this thing? And we just said, well, it's already not working doing what we're doing. Why don't we just literally give away the best thing in the course and just see what happens? And we did. And it started to blow up because they think, well, if I'm getting this for free and that's how it's, it, my, the free stuff is this good. I can't imagine what's behind the paywall, right? Mm -hmm. The other mindset is, man, this free stuff they're giving away is kind of crappy. Their other stuff must be crappy too, right? So really, I really started to shift that mindset and that next three to five years really became that. How do I make great stuff and give it away and then have something on the back end that um, had, had a lot of value. And so that little consulting business made enough money to get up to about four grand a month. So I hit that first goal, you know, within that about a year later. And once I got close to that 12 month mark, that first year I gave myself, I hadn't hit my goals yet by month 12, but I started to see momentum. And this is another mindset shift, Kayla, that I made probably about two years in is I said, what if I work in 12 month sprints? What if I always have to like renegotiate with myself? I'm going to make a contract with myself every 12 months. Every 12 months, do I want to do what I'm, what I'm doing? Do I want to keep doing what I'm doing uh, another year? If this business is working, I'm going to commit to another year. I'm not going to give up in the middle of the year, but I might, I might say, no, I'm not doing it now. I'm not going to start the year with this new one. I'm going to pivot. And so every, every, every time New Year's comes around, I look at that past year, look at my goals, and I say, is this going to get me where I want to go? And am I going to put another 12-month commitment into driving this forward? And I will never consider giving up at all during that 12 months. That served me a lot because I think wow. what happens, and I talked about this at the family reunion, is we hit these pain lines in business, right? We hit these pain lines. I had no clue at that time, Kayla, that there were pain lines. I had no clue what happened during them. I only have them in hindsight and I get to 
you know, give this to everyone listening to this. So now you have the map that I didn't have back then, but essentially things break at threes and tens, right? So 30,000, a hundred thousand, 300,000, a million, 3 million, 10 million, 30 million and above every, every one of those things start to break and get really hard. Now, what does breaking mean? It might mean that the sales mechanism you use to go from zero dollars to your first 30 K might not work as good to get to hundred K. It might mean the marketing that worked to get from, you know, me just literally emailing people the way that I did that worked to get me to four grand a month, but that wasn't going to get me to 300. Right. So I had to change the way I was doing things. It means at each one of those levels, you have to start delegating different things, getting to hundred K you can get to hundred K yourself. It's going to take some work. Right. You can get to hundred K yourself hustling while you've got your job. You can get to hundred K, but you cannot grow past 300 K and keep scaling. If you don't know how to delegate to people effectively, you cannot grow past 3 million and keep scaling. If you don't know how to build a leadership team to drive the functions of the business forward. And you cannot scale past 10 million and keep scaling. If you don't know how to hire and lead independent builders, like true executives, people who can, you can set a goal and they go build instead of having to come back for you for everything. And so at that time, those are the biggest challenges that came up for me is I kept doing all this work, but then I'm working 60, 70 hours a week. And that's when things broke. The first time was right around that 300 K with Patrick Riddle, my business partner. We're like, we're doing support. I'm writing affiliate checks. I'm doing all the books. I wrote the course. I'm writing the email copy. Patrick's doing all the speaking. And we just talked and we said, man, are we enjoying what we're doing? And we go, ah, sometimes, and sometimes we are, <laughs> but we just wrote down the things we had to get off of our laps. So we got rid of all bookkeeping, all affiliate check stuff. We hired an assistant between the two of us to help with support. And that was that the first unlock for us to get us uh, hired in that. Wow. Okay. So you talked about building up momentum, you mm -hmm. know, and so many people I see just have been coaching for 12 years they get into the momentum stage and it's new and it feels good and it's exciting. But sometimes this like self-sabotage starts mm. to come up. What would you say for the person that's kind of going through that right now? Like, okay, everything's going great in my business. I'm starting to see things happen, but they've never like, they don't know that version of themselves that can handle all of the success yet. How do they get past that and stay successful? Yeah, that, that, that's a really, really good one. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to those pain lines again. Right. Okay. So one, one thing that I have found is when we reach or when we hit those pain lines, we hit them because we are being successful. Right. We get over 300 K, we get over a million, we get over three, whatever it is, things are working. But the pain lines, actually, there's a few things my coach, Dan Martell, taught me this years ago. It's like the things that you start to manifest when you hit those pain lines are you self-sabotage, like what you mentioned. So there's the email that is in the inbox and you're like, I know if I answer that email, I'm going to get new business and I should, but you, you don't think about it. You just keep it there and you go do the other thing, right? Mm -hmm. Or the phone calls that you should be hopping on to close those deals. There's things that are in front of you that could and should grow your business further, but they, they equal more pain for you because you're going, there's already things in my business I don't love that are draining my energy. Therefore, subconsciously, I'm going to choose to not do these things that are going to give me more sales and give me more business that are going to drain more energy because amplify the problem. Right. The other thing that happens when we hit the pain line is sometimes we'll step backwards. We'll go, you know what? I, I'm doing 1.2 million a year. I was talking with one of our clients last year or a lot last week. He was doing 1.2 million uh, last year. He's now at 800,000. And when I was talking with him, I said, well, what happened? Right. He dives in. And he goes, man, he goes, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to be ambitious. And he said, Trevor, like, mm -hmm. does everyone have to grow their business? I said, well, no, you don't have to. But if your business is not growing, then you can't continue to hire people in there. And eventually that business is going to erode away. So you're going to have to, re you're going to have to fix again and again in two to three years anyway. So you might have a temporary 12 month reprieve, but then in 12 months or 24 months, you're gonna have to dive back in and basically it's a startup again because the business eroded away. Mm. And he said, I just liked my business more when it was doing like five or 600,000 a year. I go, well, why is that? Right. So he hit that pain line. He did not know how to grow to be a CEO that does one to three million a year. So he went back to what's comfortable. That's the second thing that happens when you hit your pain line. Either you're self sabotage, stop doing the things you know you should be doing. They're, they're, you're going to grow it because they create more pain, or you step backwards into what's comfortable because you know that phase. Or the third thing is you sell. 
right? You sell thinking, man, if I sell this company, it's going to remove the pain. And so what a lot of people, not all, but a lot of people I talk to that are like, man, I'm just thinking about selling my company. I want to hire a CEO and step out of it and I ask why it's because of the pain and they feel that's going to remove the pain. But then I talk to them and go, cool. What are you going to do with that money? You go, well, are, are you going to work? Are you going to retire? Well, of course I'm going to work. Okay, cool. So if you're going to work, are you going to go work for somebody now? Well, no, I'm probably going to start something else. Okay. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to do this. Okay. Well, what's going to happen next time you hit that exact same revenue mark? Cause you haven't learned how to grow through that phase. Right. Because you haven't learned how to how to delegate the right things or you haven't learned how to lead at the next level. So that's the first thing, Kayla, is recognizing that if they um, are self-sabotaging, is it because they're hitting pain in their business that they don't want to amplify? And they, they start a business because they want freedom and impact. And this business is removing freedom from them and stopping them from making the impact. All right. That's what I found there big time. The next thing is vision, though. And so th this kind of goes hand in hand with those pain lines. And I can't remember if I showed this at, at that event, but this is probably five years ago. I was at the coffee shop across the street and I was mapping out for myself mainly how I think about business and why I was going through a challenge and why I was even thinking about selling the company at that time. And I started to map it out and I was drawing these lines and, and I uh, drew this, you know, horizontal lines, a straight line across a piece of paper. That was like timeline, right? That's time. And then I drew up in the upper right corner, like where I want to be uh, ultimately. That's like my ideal transformation way in the bottom right corner. It was like, man, that's failure. And then there's a few options in between, between transformation and failure, right? And then what I drew was my path. I drew this like kind of up and down because I had gone through several companies where I stopped them or exited them or got rid of them around the three to $500,000 mark. I couldn't crack through it in hindsight because it was pain. I didn't know how to grow through mm -hmm. it. And I'd recognize mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh. Pretty much every time for me, it's around two to four years. It's like three years because we started the company. It was exciting, right? You're moving away from something you don't like, either a job yeah. you don't like, or you're moving away from some, someone telling you can't do it, or you're moving away from a business that you don't like anymore because you're not pumped about it. And so you, that, that's your initial vision. That's what fuels you. Vision for me is fuel, right? Mm -hmm. When you have vision and it's clear and it's exciting, it's fuel. It moves you forward almost effortlessly. Even when you're working hard, the vision carries you forward. And then let's say you're, you're in year two, you got the business working, it's making some money. Now you're no longer pressed by that pain that you're trying to get away from. Okay. You don't have to do that job anymore. You're able to get away from that business you didn't like. You prove the people wrong that you're trying to prove wrong, whatever it was. And now you're in like maintenance mode of this business. And then you get three years into that business. And you're like, okay, this business is working. I'm making some good money. I hit a lot of the goals I wanted to hit, but you know what? I'm just not enjoying it anymore. And maybe you hit one of those pain lines. And for me, that's because you ran out of vision. You ran out yeah. of fuel in that vision. The original mm -hmm. fuel burned out. You're on fumes now. And if we don't sit back and say, what do I want out of life? And what does the next three to five years look like? What should this business do to fuel my personal vision and get crazy excited about it? I call it refueling your vision. And we need to be doing that about every three years. But every three years, if you start to feel that angst or you don't like your business anymore or you're sabotaging or you're waking up, and this is kind of my gauge, Kayla, is if I wake up too many days in a row, I remember this from a Steve Jobs uh, commencement address he gave at Stanford years ago. He said, if you wake up too many days in a row and you look in the mirror and you ask yourself, am I excited about what I'm about to do today? And you say no, then you need to make a change. Wow. That for me is my internal barometer. If I wake up and I go, man, you know what? It's been two weeks, three weeks, a month where my energy is drained and I'm just not really pumped about work. I don't want to do this today. You need to make a change. And it's either you get to cast, you get to sit down, cancel your work day for the day or two, go to the river or wherever you love to think and just write down, where do I want to go in life? Who do I want to be 20 years out, 10 years out, five years out? And then ask yourself, how does work fit into that? What does work look like in 20 years and 10 years and five years? And then say, if that's what my life looks like, my ideal life, I would love in five years. And this is what my work looks like and the types of things I get to do and the types of people I get to work with. Ask yourself, does my current business cannot get me there? Can that be the vehicle that can get me there? If I change it, if I adjust my job, if I hire the right people, if I innovate within my existing business, if you absolutely come to the end of it and you're like, you know what, this existing business cannot get me there. And that's what I came to in 2012 when Patrick Riddle and I parted ways as business partners, not friends, but business partners. For me, that business wouldn't get me where I wanted to go. 
And so I gave myself another year going back to 2007, 2008. I said, I'm resetting. My income went from two or 300,000 a year personally in 2011, 12. I knew I was going to have to go down because I sold that business for almost nothing. I just wanted to get my time back. I didn't need the money from it. I don't want the money from it. I just want my time back. And my, my tax return, I saw it a number of years ago when we moved to our current house. And I was making 250,000 a year the, the previous years before that. My tax return for the year of 2013 uh, was $27,000. Oh, wow. And so I had a 10x drop in my income, but that's what I needed to then say, what's the new platform I'm going to build on in Springboard? That's what became Carrot in 2013. Wow. Okay. So explain to everybody listening in right now, what is Carrot? Yeah. So th- th- this was kind of one of those pivot journeys and same thing. I want to give people permission in your business to ask that question. Look at that vision. Are you pumped about what you're doing? Do you see a vision for how that's going to, that, that business can be your vehicle to help you live the life you want to live and make the impact you want to live, you want to make. And for me, that previous company had a little side product that we gave away for free because our customers would come to us. It was an online publishing company. We published things in the real estate industry based on Patrick's expertise. And uh, I was, I was a marketing business guy and people kept coming to us saying like, Hey, um, you know, where's the best place to get a website as a real estate investor. And I knew, I knew a lot of good things about marketing. I knew how to, how to get things ranked well in Google at that time. I'd probably done 800 split tests on the websites we were running. So we ran a ton of paid traffic through our our sites. I knew the real estate market really well, had generated probably 10,000 leads myself and for some clients in that market. And I looked at all the website options in the market. I'm like, ah, I don't want to send them to any of them because they're all terrible. They're, they're all really bad. And, and for me, what terrible meant was there was a million ways to, to launch a website, right? You could go to any of the people in the market at that time that you could launch a web, a real estate investor website with, and you could select from their 35 design options and give you all these options. Or I don't know if Wix was around at that time. They may have been, but there were other tools like that, right? Uh, Go, GoDaddy had a website builder at that time. And I'm going, the the flaw that there was in the market was what people really needed was results. What they thought they wanted was a a pretty website. And so what the industry was was serving up was a pretty website that had no data to determine if it got good results. And based on my previous three years, all it was about was results. And I'm like, I think I can go into the market and provide something that actually is just 100% focused on results. It puts some of the design on lockdown so you don't mess it up, but it just, it's going to get results. And so in that publishing company with Patrick, people were coming to us asking for websites. I would say, no, they're all bad. So I paid a web guy uh, to make a WordPress template. I'm like, hey, dude, can you just make a WordPress template? We would just give it to people. And then I give it to people and they'd be like, what do I do with this file? Like, what do I do with this WordPress file? None of them knew how to do anything with it. I go, okay, well, pay me 50 bucks. I'll put it on my, my host gator reseller account. And just pay me 50 bucks for that. And you can just keep it there. Realized that was a terrible model because now <laughs> they wanted support. So I'm like, cool, let's make it recurring revenue. So I go, well, just pay me 10 bucks a month, which is even worse because now they're paying every month and they expect even more support. Right. And I'm not making any money on that. And so I had about 100 people that should have been paying some degree, either maybe half paid 50 and the other half were supposed to be paying 10 bucks a month, but their credit card would decline. I wouldn't follow up with, on them. So I might've been making a couple hundred bucks a month kind of a thing, maybe. And when Patrick and I split ways, this website thing was kind of on my servers. It was my thing. And I was literally that night, uh, Kayla, I remember, because I read the book, The Pumpkin Plan right before that by Mike Michalowicz. And that, that visual just seared into my brain on, I had all these different pumpkins on these vines. And he said, you just need to find the one pumpkin that has the most promise, trim everything else and focus on that. And so I was looking at all my different business dealings at that time. Because I had hit that pain line of that three to 500,000 a year, Kayla, I was getting distracted by new opportunity rather than learning how to up level as a CEO and grow that existing business. So I invested in two tech companies. One of them completely failed. The other one now is a multiple eight figure year company that's blowing up called salesmessage.com. That one had two pivots to get where it is now. I had my marketing consulting. I still have my you know, business partnership with, with uh, Patrick. And then I had these little websites over here. And so I was sitting there that night saying, I'm going to trim everything but one thing. I'm just going to keep my marketing consulting. I'm going to get out of the two tech companies. I'm going to sell my part to Patrick. Now, what do I do with these sites? And so I looked at it 
And I go, I don't know, maybe before I hit delete and send everyone their file and say, hey, I love you, but you need to take this file somewhere else. Maybe there's opportunity here. And something just percolated in my brain to go, oh man, I think it's not just a real estate challenge. Everyone learned how to get online in you know, 2000, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's when all of your local mom and pop web development shops popped up. That's when Wix, Weebly, Squarespace, they all popped up. They made it right. easy to get online. But what they weren't doing was helping you get results. I said, I think the next wave, the next decade is about results. It's, the get online easy part's taken care of. It's about results. And so I said, before I hit delete in this, let me go talk to some of those people. And I went and talked to them the next day. And they said, yeah, I'd, I'd actually like more for me. I'd be pay, willing to pay more, more uh, for you for this. And I said, oh, cool. Let me give myself a year to see if this is a business. And so I did, dove in with them, set a goal. No, no revenue goal that year, Kayla. I just said, I just want to see if, if I can get traction with this this year. I'm, gonna, I'm okay with my income going down this year. It's a, it's a reset year. And if by the end of the year, I see there's enough traction that I think, that I think that we can be the best in the industry. That was the, the bar I had set. Year one is test it out, see if it's if there's something there. And I said, the only way I will start year two is if I can be the best in the industry at this. Wow. And we did. And we just kept growing from there and scaling it. But So what kind of results? What kind of results did you measure that people needed to get in that first year? Yeah, for sure. I didn't answer your earlier question. Sorry. I get excited about things sometimes. I, it's, it's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so what what Carrot does and the results that that we measured in that business room, if we were doing it another year, was we help people get online leads as a real estate investor or okay. what we call hybrid agent. It's someone who's looking for motivated house sellers, cash buyers, mobile home sellers, land sellers, the whole thing. So if you're looking to sell a piece of property and you go to the internet and you're trying to find someone to sell it, you're, you're probably going to find between three and eight carrot sites controlling page one in Google in every city in America, going up into Canada, South Africa now too. So you'll, you'll find powered by carrot at the bottom of most sites that are like sell my house fast, Wisconsin, sell my house fast, Portland, sell my house fast, Long Beach, we buy houses, cash home buyers, all those phrases, carrot dominates them. And so the, the first year was honestly all about results for the customer. So going back to that same principle right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to get mine. I can, I can be patient. I'm going to try to just get results for the customer. And so every single day I would be diving into our support ticket deal. I was the support guy for the first probably year and a half to two years because I needed to be co close with the customer. And I would see that they needed to do these things. I'm like, if you just do these things, if you just update the title tag at the top of it with this thing, you'll actually rank better, but they wouldn't do it. And so I hit up this web guy that I hired for 10 hours a week, who was then building out the product. He was the third web guy I had gone through. So I fast forward through that part of it, went through three tech guys, finally found the right one. And I would just throw those ideas to Chris, my, my CTO. And I'm like, Chris, no one's doing this thing. Like they need to be putting their title tag up here with their city. And here should, this should be the title tag, but they're not doing it. Can you automate this? And so we just kept doing that. All these things, if they would just do this, they'd have success. And I'd go to Chris, can you automate this? Can you automate this? And then we automated enough things to where things started to take off. Our clients started wow. to rank in Google and, and all these cities, they started to get leads. The next thing, Kayla, this is where it was exciting. I said, I want to build a business that people love the brand, that they resonate with what we're about, not just what we do for them, mm -hmm. that it's fun. I want to build a business that they literally, we have people coming to us and comparing us to Disney. And that, that's what I said back then. I'm like, I want people, we hadn't won until we get someone in our, in our email inbox saying, oh my gosh, I was at Disney last week and I would put your guys' support up against you know, Disney's experience. And that happened. Wow. That happened about two years in. And so that's all I focused in on, customer results and customer experience. And let me just do that all day. Wow. Okay. So I think a lot of people listening in right now are want to be real estate investors. So yep. they're like, what? I need a website. Yeah. <laughs> so explain to people at what point, you know, in your real estate investing journey, should mm. you get a website up and going? It, it, it's a good question. So I'm going to, I'm going to take it from two different angles. So if you, if you look at like the data or the public records on how many real estate investors are there in America, there's some crazy number, like 12 million or something. Right. right. But, but the data that they're pulling is anybody who owns a rental property usually. So it's the person who's got a job and they were able to pick up a duplex or a fourplex like I, I you know, did early on. So for that group of people who you're stacking up some rentals on the side, you've got an active income job over here, but you're picking up rentals. You may not ever need a website unless you build enough rentals up where you want to get tenants. That's what I use Carrot for right now. 
So I get tenant leads that are literally texted to me three to four times a week that just find me organically th through Google. Okay, that's awesome. We've got a, an apartment building by a college in Klama Falls. And so when people search certain phrases like apartments near Oregon Tech or OIT or apartments near the hospital, my carrot site will pop up and I'll get leads. And those all just go to my property manager now for our properties or anyone. And he pays me for the leads that are overflow leads, which is kind of cool. So if, if you're just stacking stuff up on the side, you don't need a site. Where you might need one as you grow is let, let's say if you're trying to attract lenders, you want more institutional money and you're trying to build credibility. So uh, I've got a, a buddy and a client down in Texas. They moved from being a, they're still a flipper and a wholesaler. They have a seven figure business there. And they said, we want to start to stack up what I call evergreen income. Let's get off of the income hamster wheel, which is transactional income. And let's take some of that money and put it into evergreen income, income that just keeps on coming in. And so they are acquiring large apartment buildings now. So I'm in a few of the deals with them and they need a credibility website. Mm -hmm. They need to, when they're talking with the banks or the lenders that they're raising, you know, a couple million from for this deal, people need to be able to Google them and find out, are they legit? So they post their portfolio on there. They're called the apartment buying guys, apartmentbuyingguys.com. Their site doesn't look great, uh, but it works. They could do some things on our carrot system, to make it look better, but it works really well. And that's to attract private lenders and build credibility for banks. So if you're flipping or wholesaling houses, land, whatever, I think everybody should have a website. Now, here's why. A, a lot of, and it's not just because I own the business. I own the business because I think everyone should do this because the market's yeah. big enough. So let's say you're doing cold calling or direct mail and that's all you're doing and it works great, right? I've talked to people where they go, dude, I just cold call. I get all my deals from cold calling. You're driving for dollars. Like, why do I need a website? Well, what happens when we're making a big decision, a big financial decision, or buying a TV? We go to Google and we research mm -hmm. it. Right. Mm -hmm. We search up X, Y, Z TV reviews, or we're going to you know, try to lock down this, this financial planner. We're trying to find out financial planner or whatever it is. We usually go on the internet and ser search up about that person. Like, are they legit? Who are they? And if we can't find anything about them, these alarms go off in our minds. We go, Hmm, either they must be so amazing that they don't need a website, which usually isn't the case with most people yeah. or they must not be real. And I should have these little alarms going off. Mm -hmm. And so, and especially now, if you're doing marketing, let's say you're sending out direct mail and you have your company name on there. We see a large amount of people that Google search a company name online and find out who they are. Uh, if you're cold calling or text messaging people, we're finding in our data and interviews with sellers, they're tech, they're Google searching the phone number that you called, that you yeah. called them from to find out who is this company. Okay. So that you're all offline marketing drives online demand. And if your average profit per deal is a flipper or a wholesaler is 25 or 40 K, how many $30,000 deals are you losing right now because you're creating all this demand with your offline marketing, they're going online and you're not painting the right picture to build trust and credibility. If you're losing one deal a year, that costs you 30 grand to not have the right website. Mm -hmm. How many of those are you mm -hmm. actually losing? A client of ours, Carter Steff, he's a flipper, wholesaler and agent in Oklahoma City, the largest buyer in that market. He's a radio, TV and direct mail guy. And he had a website and the website was pretty. It got some leads, but we dove into the data with him. And we said, man, Carter, I think you're losing deals just from your offline marketing and the people finding. He's like, well, how? And he moved over to Carrot. We switched him over to our model of doing things. Insanely fast sites, the right content, right place to paint the right story, high conversion, better ranking ability. He added 20,000 a month in new income. Literally from the first month, he switched the site. Wow. Only because of the different things in the different order that people saw on the website, it pre-positioned him to be the best option, built trust and credibility. So he added 240000 a year in new income just from his existing offline marketing he was already doing. So that's kind of how I look at it. Buy and hold person, you're just picking up some properties, don't need a site unless you want to do a personal blog someday. House flipper, wholesaler, need a site, even if you're doing offline marketing. If you want to do online marketing, the leads are even better. Or if you're getting really big on multifamily or self-storage or something, a website for credibility uh, for capital raising is really useful. Mm -hmm. I've seen that with with both of my funds. <laughs> yep. And I was like, I need a website. My my Invest Next portal is not enough to just yep. have people log in and, and see the offerings and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, okay. What are some common mistakes you see real estate investors specifically make in their online marketing efforts. So they have a website and they're trying, maybe mm. they're on social media. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see? 
Yeah. So the biggest mistake I find, Kayla, with with people doing marketing in general is they do marketing backwards from how it should be done. And, and I'll, I'll explain it. I, I have this, this graphic I could show, but I'll, I'll verbalize it for everyone listening. So if you kind of look at like a customer journey and it's almost like a, a sideways hourglass kind of a thing, you know, we're mm-hmm. way on the left side of that customer journey is kind of awareness. They're, they're just trying to figure out who, you know, who can solve my problem. They're doing research on it maybe. And then right in from that, then you've got a person who they, they're, they're becoming a lead now, maybe, right. They're landing on websites or they're calling people from postcards or something. And then right, right to the right, right side of that before the other part of the hourglass goes up and the, in the thin part is what I call the, the decision phase. That's where they, they understand they have a problem. They've looked at the options, they've researched them. They see that there's three agents I could work with locally. And here's two investors I've talked about. Now they need to make a decision. Mm-hmm. Right. And what most people do is they start their marketing way on the left side and say, I'm going to get, I'm going to get more traffic. I'm going to get my direct mail going. I'm going to start doing Google pay-per-click or Facebook ads or, or whatever, and get traffic coming because that's what I need. But what happens is if, is if you drive this traffic through, even if you're getting the leads where we find deals being lost is actually at the decision phase is when they have discovered you as a solution and others, and now they're trying to make a choice. And when they're on your website, they're not seeing what they need to see to push them over the edge that you're the most credible and trustworthy source to work with. Mm. And so we always say you should work backwards in your marketing. You should start at the decision phase and then work backwards. And what does that mean? That means build a website that, that has the right things, right places, a few of those key things. The number three most visited page on all of our 13,000 websites across our network is always the about page. It's between mm. two and four. Right. So if someone lands on your website, the first things in your homepage should just address, do they have a service that can help me? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It looks like they buy houses, they pay cash. I, I know I want to sell my house and I'm in this market. They, it looks like they probably have something that can help me. The next question they ask is, well, how does this thing work? How's it different than working with an agent or an iBuyer? And so you should have a how it works page with some content. But the very next thing they're going to be popping up is around credibility. Like, who are these people? Or has anyone worked with them before? So you need to have a really good about page. Don't be afraid to put yourself or your team or both on that about page. Talk about why you do what you do, not just what you do. A little bit about your story. People work with people, not with businesses. And then really build out a good reviews page. And on the reviews side of it, if you guys just do these things alone and you'll make sure the, the site's localized, you'll win more deals. Write down your top three to five objections. And this works for you raising capital for your big deals too, right? It's like, what are the top three to five objections that my prospects have when they're buying this service or even working with me. And so with a house flip or a wholesaler, it tends to be, well, they're probably gonna lowball me or can they actually close that quickly or whatever. Mm -hmm. With an investor, a private lender lending into a deal, it's, oh shoot, can I trust that person to actually not lose my money? Is this deal too good to be true? Should I invest in that deal? Why Why should I just not put it in the stock market? Right, there's things like that. So write down those objections now think about your customers or look at your next deals and say, my job is to get reviews or, or testimonials that eliminate or blast those objections. All testimonials should be for is to eliminate objections. And so when you worked with someone who, who took the money out of the stock market, and that's an objection other people have, why don't I just put it in the stock market? Isn't a sure bet over 30 years. And then you ask that person, say, hey, Mark, it's been so cool. I'm so pumped. We had a chance to close this deal together. You got all your money back, you got a great return. Da, 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 da. I'd like some feedback. Uh, I'm always looking to improve things and get things better. Would you mind if I ask you a few questions to get some feedback to make your services better? They're always going to say yes. And then you work back to the other side of it, get their whole story arc. I'm going to fast forward it for sake of time, but then ask a couple questions around their challenges. Hey, Mark. So I know when we started working together, you were thinking about, should you keep it in the stock market and move it over? You moved it over. What were the concerns you had? How did we overcome those for you? What was it that we did to help you overcome those? Why did you end up working with me versus others? Record all that stuff. Yes. And then, you know, or write it out. And then that testimonial literally says, I was hesitant on, on taking my funds out of my stock, uh, out of my stocks that performed well the last 10 years. But I knew that da, 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 my concerns, da, da, da. And I trusted Kayla because of their proven process. And here's the results. So, those are the biggies. Um, one last one, Kayla, on the marketing side is if I were to just simplify a couple things is people need to remove emotion from their marketing and trust math. Ooh. The way that way emotion comes up in marketing is this. 
someone will hit, hit me up or hit my team up and they'll say, hey, I've got 1500 a month. What can you do for 1500 a month? That's an emotional budget decision. That's, I don't want to risk more than 1500 a month. So therefore, I'm going to bring this 1500 a month to this person. And I'm going to say, you fit within my, my emotional risk box to try to deliver me, deliver me a result. What I do instead is I work with the person and say, cool, um, well, let, let's figure it out first. What's your average profit per deal? Okay, let's write that down. Oh, it's 20,000 bucks. Great, cool. Awesome. How many, how many leads does it take to get you that deal using the type of marketing you're currently doing now? And I'll tell you how many leads it takes to get that type of a deal doing the marketing we do with online. Okay, it's one in 10, approximately maybe one in 15. Great. So 20,000 bucks a deal, one in 10, one in 15 leads. And then how much would you be willing to trade in marketing to get that deal? I, I like to start with the four to one ratio. That's a pretty standard direct response, ROAS or LTV to CAC, four to one. All right. And so that 50, that 20 K, that means you'd be willing to invest five grand to get the 20 K. Now we don't want to go too much farther, you know, over five grand. We maybe could on the first deal or two, but we want to keep it around five grand and below. Does that sound good? Yep. It sounds great. Cool. So if you're going to close a one in 10 leads into a deal and you're willing to put five grand into that deal, divide those out. That means you can spend up to 500 bucks a lead. Math says you can spend 500 bucks a lead. Now, do I want to spend 500 bucks a lead? No, I'd rather get them for 100 or two or three, but math says you can spend up to 500 bucks a lead and that you should be willing to spend up to five grand to get a deal. Great. So I'm going to tell you what I could do for 1500 a month. If you truly want one deal a month from this method, you're going to have to up your budget to five grand a month. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, if you want to lock it in at 1500 a month, then you're going to have to be okay with that taking you probably two to three months, two to four months to get a deal. Is that okay with you? Well, no, I want to get more deals. Awesome. Right. Let's remove emotion from this now. What math tells us is you just told me you'd be willing to spend five grand to get a $20,000 deal. One in 10 of those leads turns into this. That means we can spend this much for it. You should not stop your marketing before you hit that five grand then, as long as your marketing is good, effective marketing. So that's the next biggest mistake, Kayla, that people make that sets them off on the wrong path from the start. They end up burning cash. Might as well throw it down the toilet. I see way too many people who literally get $2,000 into a marketing campaign, stop it because they got six leads and they didn't hit that 10 or 15 leads to get that deal. And they might as well just throw that down the toilet. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, when you explain it like that, it's like a duh situation. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love that because I always say um, people lie, but numbers don't. And that's how I tend to make decisions. So I love that you said, you know, take the emotion out of it and look at the math. Because I think more and more people, like when we start to make logical decisions in our business, you start to get better results. Mm. We're such emotional beings sometimes, you know? Yep. So I love taking it back to that. Trevor, I don't want to take up too much more of your time because this, this has been absolutely amazing. I feel like we've talked about so many different things when it comes to mindset. <laughs> yeah, we've hit a lot, haven't we? we have. Yeah, real estate investing. And I just think you're a huge inspiration to so many people. And just, you know, giving everybody on here a permission slip, really. Like if, if one thing is not working out for you and you've given yourself a good year, it's like, okay, it's okay to pivot and try something new. Yep. I think that's definitely what I hope people take away. And where can people find you, Trevor? Yep. So, um, probably Instagram's the best spot is Trevor.mock, T R E V O R. There is an Instagram scammer out there. That's T R E A V O R. Don't get oh, that shoot. person. Okay. Uh, they won't take them off, but T R E V O R dot mock M A U C H. And I have a podcast called The Carrot Cast. So I do the, the episodes on Thursdays. And Kayla, this is like this type of thing right here that we're talking about. That's what I talk about on Thursdays. It's on my cell phone. They're called Trevor Truck Talks. It's when I'm driving 15 minutes to my house uh, once a week. I just talk about what's going through my mind as an entrepreneur. All these topics we talked about, I've dove in on those episodes even deeper. But that's called The Carrot Cast. I like the vegetable. Or if you're looking to, to get leads online or just learn how to do so, we have a lot of free content at carrot.com and, uh, and we can help you there. Awesome. And we'll make sure to link everything up in the show notes, including the right Instagram so people can find you. <laughs> so thank you so much, Trevor, for being on cool. today. Awesome. And th thank you, Kayla. Guys, everyone listening to this, you are following such an amazing woman and an inspiration in her own right. And so keep diving in with her. That's one of the biggest things I found is when you find someone you trust, stick with that person you trust, go deep with everything they do rather than skipping and trying 45 different mentors. Stick with Kayla. I'm so pumped to be on here with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.